Today, I wanna to teach you how to make an amazing mixed berry mead. So let's get started. So this mead we're gonna to make today is a mixed berry bomb, as I'll call it, meaning it is super strong, high ABV, a ton of fruit, a ton of honey, and it, it's gonna be expensive, but it's also really stinking good. I have a huge container of it right here. This is a 6.5 gallon uh, carboy that is full of the meat. Now you might be saying, why is it not in bottles? I'm gonna talk about that here in a little bit, but this right here, this mead, used a ton of that honey and fruit. So I'm gonna pop a recipe card on screen real fast. This is for a gallon of this mead. Of course, if you wanna make more, multiply by however much you want there. The only uh, multiplication factor you might not add is your yeast. It's a little bit different. Everything else, you just take that card and you multiply it by three, four, five, whatever. In this circumstance, 6.5 gallons left of this brew means that I started with a lot of mead in the beginning. So my recipe card, again, for one gallon, you're gonna see me using way more fruit, way more honey throughout my video, but I just did a bigger batch. So this mixed berry mead features raspberry, blackberry, and blueberries. I found a lot of frozen fruit at my local Sam's, which is like an easy place to buy bulk stuff if you have that local to you. I used frozen. You can use, of course, fresh fruit if you have access to that, but I just found it easier to do this. I bought a lot of fruit. So for me, I bought 24 pounds of mixed berries. I had a 60 pound pail of orange blossom honey that was fresh to me, so I used that honey. I'd used my own tap water. You can use store-bought water. You can use RO water if you have access to that and those things. Uh, we used the Lauvin Borgevin RC212 because it's great with berries and red wines and things like that. It also adds some more tannic value, some more mouth uh, feel, body, and chew to your brew. We did end up oaking this brew with some American oak, so it has a little bit of that character from the wine. It is sweet, just spoilers. This mead specifically, and the way I tell you to make it, will end up sweet. It's also like 16, no, it's about 15% ABV, so it is very, very strong. So once you have your mixed berries, however you got them, you're going to get your honey, of course, and you're gonna basically take, and you're gonna need to help the mixed berries break down easier for them to provide more fruit profile for this. So start by taking all of your fruit, putting it in a bucket or a container of sorts, and putting some pectic enzyme on it. You can buy pectic enzyme in little containers or however else you wanna do it, but this stuff helps to break down the fruit skins, which helps release more juice out of the fruit. So what I did was I took all my fruit, put it in a bucket, I sprinkled a fair amount of pectic enzyme over the top of them, and they were frozen at this point. We let that set for like 24 or 48 hours. They thawed in that time, and they also had, had plenty of time for that pectic enzyme to break down the fruit skins, which again is the process that we need here. At that 48 hour mark, because I'm making a huge batch, I ended up taking and splitting my fruit into two different buckets. Now for you, you'll probably just do this in one bucket, but because I was starting with roughly about 10 to 12 gallons of volume, I didn't have a container that was that large. So I had to use two different buckets for mine. So I split out my fruit. You don't have to do that. You can just do it in one. I added my honey, kind of split my honey as well into both of those, which we used for this recipe, 34 pounds of orange blossom honey alongside our 24 pounds of fruit. You're not going to use all that, of course. We then moved that to the sink and we got our water up to again, about 10, 11 gallons, I would say for each side in total and we mixed it up with a drill. We had the drill attachment and we just spun it up, added some oxygen, mixed up the honey and the water and the uh, mixed berry juice, of course. So at this point, it was really well blended. If you have a fruit press, you can also do that. We are fermenting on the skins of these fruits and that's gonna help add some more tannic value to this, which is very helpful, more mouth body, mouth feel and chew to this brew. You don't have to ferment on skins, you could just do the juice, of course, if you have a press or something like that. 
With this being in two different buckets, my starting gravities was a little bit different on each side. So I'm saying my composite starting gravity is about 1.135. For you, you'll wanna aim for about that level. The Borgevin, Lauvin Borgevin RC212 goes up to 16% roughly. So theoretically, it's gonna chew through a bulk of that sugar there. Um, but again, we'll see depending on how the fermentation goes. We started our gravity at that 1.135, took a gravity reading, of course. I had made a yeast starter. This is very, very important for you. With this starting at such a high starting gravity, the yeast are basically thrown into a, I'm trying to think example for us as people, I don't really have one. It's kind of like you just jumped in some lava. All of a sudden you're going, oh my gosh, what's going on? There's so much sugar content. The gravity is huge. Those yeast need some help. They need some prep. So what I did was I took my Lauvin Borgevin RC212 yeast, I put it in a mason jar, I put some uh, warm water with that about 24 hours before I wanted to pitch my yeast. I then also added a little bit of sugar water, sugar into that, so that they would start really fermenting and waking up. They also built up a colony, kind of, in this circumstance, and they were ready to go into the brew. So that's, that's what you see here. I'm taking my mason jar of yeast starter and putting it into both containers there. I basically split it too, so they had the same amount of yeast to go. We got everything mixed up. Huge mead, two different buckets for me, one for you. We are now going to let them set and ferment. It will probably take roughly, this is an estimate, three, four, maybe five weeks to ferment through all of the sugars that they can. This is a huge mead. Another step to really help make sure your yeast are healthy, of course, you are thinking about giving the yeast starter a chance, letting that go, but you're also going to provide them with plenty of nutrient. So there's options here. On my recipe card, I include Fermate O as the primary source. In this circumstance, I did two things. I used dimonium phosphate at the 24 hour mark to uh, kind of get them going. That's a great yeast nutrient at the beginning of fermentation. You don't wanna add it on later. So 24 hours, we added some dimonium phosphate, and then at my 48 hour mark, we added plenty of Fermate O to get us where we needed to go. I only include the Fermate O on the recipe card because it will suffice, it will do the job. It's organic, it will be just fine. If you really wanna help your yeast be healthy, you can step feed this whole fermentation meaning you could add your nutrients over time at day, some at day zero, some at day two and four and six, and really just kind of help it ferment through all of the sugars there. About five weeks later, our yeast were done. They had flocculated to the bottom. I knew this because I opened up the container and saw everything was still, I saw no more bubbling. I took a gravity reading and our gravity post fermentation was 1.024. So we actually ended up uh, again, about 15%-ish, we landed below the yeast cap. Now, to me, I, I was a little bit sketched out at first. I was like, uh-oh, am I gonna have re-fermentation? I think the yeast really just did hit their cap. It just happens, sometimes it's lower than the listed ABV. Sometimes it can be higher depending on how they ferment. So just know that. 1.024 for uh, both of them, roughly, prospectively. We then went ahead and racked them into a new container, into a new bucket. I kind of blended them here, roughly. I went ahead and put them into this one bucket that I could, and we stabilized this brew. We stabilized it with potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite. Your options are pasteurizing, that stabilizing method I just mentioned. Those were kind of it. Those are your ways to halt any further fermentation. I'm assuming it was done regardless, because of where it stopped with fermentable sugars still available, but I would rather play it safe and go ahead and stabilize this brew and not run any risk of more fermentation. So we stabilized it, allowed us to truly be safe with adding more honey, which is what we did. After the stabilizer sat in for about 48 hours, we oaked the brew with American oak. So I took one ounce of American oak chips, put them in a, in a uh, mason jar, put a little water on them to help them kind of rehydrate and get more character out of them at the beginning, then we pitched that into our bucket. At that point, this bucket was all of the mead, and so we went from like 10 gallons, and after all the fruit and stuff came out, we were setting at roughly about 7.5, I believe, is where it was. 
For you, of course, you're gonna use less oak in this circumstance, so just know that. And you can use whatever form of oak, chips, cubes, spirals, barrels, if you have access, but the oak is really gonna help continue to pronounce a, um, I would give the, say this, I would say more of like a true mead profile in that it's got this complexity between your fruit, your honey, and then tannin. And so the tannin here is also gonna come in the form of oak and the taste, and American oak is just a solid oak to use for a brew like this. We added our oak three weeks or so on that one ounce of uh, American oak chips for this. I think the oak was really helpful to also round out some of the harsh edges of the fruit profile being bright because of the raspberries there. We racked the mead off of the oak into a new container with about four pounds of orange blossom honey for us. For you, it'll be about a half a pound. Our final gravity after mixing that up was roughly 1.037 or somewhere in that regard. So decently sweet. So we had oak, we had a ton of berry flavor, we had sweetness there. We let that set in that bucket for a little bit longer and then we racked it one more time into this container right here. We have roughly about seven gallons of mead. There's a little bit over in the corner right here. It's still in this container because I'm letting it bulk age like this instead of bottle age right now. One, because of space. It's just easier for me to do this than have 25 to 30 wine bottles floating around in my space. But two, Another pro of bulk aging is this thing is going to um, age more evenly. It's also 15%, so it needs some time. At this point that I'm shooting this, this guy is only about three months old. Now, I'm gonna show you a tasting that I did with this at about the two and a half month mark for this mead's age. Or, uh, yeah, about two and a half. I'm not saying this mead is perfect right now because it is high ABV, the fruit really need time to meld. Everything needs time to just kind of cohesively work together. But this mead does taste very good. It will stay like this for a while. So I'm gonna to jump to a tasting I did with Matthew, who is a great friend, amazing mead maker, and uh, he's gonna help us do this tasting and talk about this brew. I think even at this point, because the, the fermentation was healthy, it's still pretty good, but I'm gonna let you and Matthew uh, be the ones to judge this. So that's the whole process. If you wanna make this thing, you can do it at that one gallon version. It is expensive. This is one of the most expensive brews I've ever made because of the amount of honey and the amount of fruit that were involved. But it is very good. I'm also gonna show right here, before we jump to the tasting, I'm sending this off to some competitions. And again, young, it is hitting these competitions at the two and a half, three month mark. So. Um, I'm factoring that into my scores a little bit, but here are the scores that I received for this mead at this age. And I hope that when I send it off later to competitions, it does better because of the melding and the time. But let's go to the tasting of this mead. All right, here we are. I've got Matthew, who is the winner of the Ultimate Mead Maker of 2023, which we're gonna talk about that later on, more details, but he, uh, in short, is a fantastic mead maker and friend who's been on the channel before, who's helped me with lots of tastings, and uh, I trust his palate. So, Matthew, thank you for helping me with this tasting. Yeah, thanks. I'm excited to be doing it. One fun fact about Matthew is one of the first meads I ever had of his was a uh, boysenberry, I'm going to call it a bomb, <laughs> you know, fruit bomb. It was a bomb. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was sent into Mead Stampede 2021, I think. And, or 2020, whatever you 2021. Yeah. Fantastic. And so whenever I had this brew, had this mixed berry bomb, I was like, who of my friends is like the mixed berry king, so to speak? And I thought of you. So I hope I don't disappoint. Yeah, it's flattering. <laughs> um, the viewers saw everything here, but tons of fruit. So much honey. So much money went into this mead. And I... I believe it will be okay. I'm thinking it needs some more time because this is only sack strength, 14.5%. We are setting at three months old. A little over three months. So very young for the tasting. However, I'm curious what your notes are. Yeah, I mean, it's that huge fruit and honey on the aroma that's just 
immediately obvious, right? Yeah. It is. It's very candle-like. What I love about mixed berry meads is the acid balance is already there. <laughs> you just back sweeten it to <laughs> so much and to have to balance it though. That's the problem. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's both the acids and the tannins are really present in this. And, mm -hmm. and um, it is, it's one of the, one of the neat things about working with fruit is you can sort of design your recipe to get those things where they are instead of fussing with a bunch of powders after the fact. Right. Um, and that's one of the reasons I really like doing fruit stuff is just, um, you know, you can get this nice harmonious mead. Um, and all these things are here. Like, uh, it's, uh, you know, obviously it's wheat, but there's a bunch of tannin, there's a bunch of acid. Um, it is a, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Did you say this is raspberry, blackberry, blueberry? Is that right? Yes, correct. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to pick out individual fruits. I think raspberry really stands out. It is very strong. That's the, I feel like where most of that acid is really hitting. Yeah, I mean, it, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very sweet, but not, it's very bad, you know, it's balanced with the acidity and tannin. I think that's where it should be. Um, there's like some slight bitter tannic note in hmm. the finish. Do you get that? Mm -hmm. Sort of. Yeah. Um, so that's something I've experienced on a few different, yeah, different fruits. Um, but I mean, I think, you know, it's, I think we talked a little bit about this off camera. This is something you kind of expected is going to need to, to some time to meld together and things. And I mean, I think it's clearly on its way. Um, yeah. I'm enjoying it very much. I, I just I feel like I should. <laughs> My biggest gripes with it is the, that ABV presence. There is that tannin at the end, like you said, or that kind of, I don't know. There's like a weird finish. Doesn't quite land. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if that's something that just needs mellowing. Obviously, with this being like a 14, 15% brew in only two, what did I say, two, less than three months, something like that, this is young. It's going to need some time. So I'm curious to see how that changes over time. But also, as someone who really, I really enjoyed doing this, even though it was arguably the most expensive meat I've ever had to make <laughs> between the fruit and all those things, I really want to do it again. And so there's all these like ideas of like, what do I notice about this here? How can I convert it to be a little bit better? And that's why I don't really know. That's where I'm stuck. And I'm wondering if time is the real uh, answer here to see like, how is the acidity really going to change over time? Not change, but mellow over time comparative to that honey character that will hopefully continue to rise up and the alcohol content come down and you know, all that. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing you'll notice with these meads with really big structure is that over time, like those cannons, like, polymerize right so those are molecules are chaining together and kind of falling out of suspension and it we, will change a lot and i think mm -hmm. um uh usually for you know usually in pleasing ways right and, and the i know the flavor we're talking about and i don't i mean i i suspect that's something that you'll see reduced over time but it's, it's hard to know for sure i had one so that batch of boysenberry you referred to that i sent the meat stampede was the second time i had done that meeting the first time i did it it was just way too tannic mm. um and I didn't really, I don't really know what I did wrong, but, but, uh, um, a friend had a bottle that we opened years later and that was all gone. Like it was completely flooded. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think some of those things you'll see hmm. change and transform, but I, I mean, it's very pleasant. I, I, it's certainly not, uh, I mean, we're looking for something to nitpick, right? And I think it's just super <laughs> nicely. Uh, nitpicking is fine. Elements, I'm all yeah. for nitpicking. It's that, that's a yeah. good thing about, um, you know, for me, nitpicking as a teacher is me trying to continue to just to make people you know better i'm not trying to be uh brewed with it and i know that's just how it is so i'm all about notes with these things uh i might be sending you another bottle maybe a year from now maybe it'll be a comparative you can have this tasting and then you can say like well what changed because i've got a lot of the mead i'm setting on like i said six gallons of it and so Obviously, if I drink all of this myself, then I'm in real trouble because that's a lot of 15% mead. Um, but it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, it, it's, uh, I, I predict good things for this in the future. So um, my note I was going to share with you, send it off to a comp. What would actually, how about this? What would you give this if you drank this at a comp, mead comp, mead stampede, any or other, what would you give this brew? I mean, I think the only, like, 
flaw is just that so, so the initial impression is I mean the, the aroma impression is good the um, visual impression is good so you're going to score highly on the first two categories the initial flavor impression is just great like it's it's the berries um, the sweetness and it's just the finish where there's that that slight bitter tannic note right so that's going to be the one note that you're going to get in a sheet so I mean you're sort of I, I think this is going to end up high 30s probably mm -hmm. like very high 30s um, yeah it would be I think it's, pro it's probably where I would put it I don't know like I, I feel like I score a little lower than a lot of people so maybe maybe we're pushing into the no, I... or something but so, well, the comp that I sent it to, um, BC actually predicted a number because I told him I've sent it off to uh, Mazer, which but this video won't be out before Mazer. So uh, here's what I got at Mazer on this thing. And um, then uh, the Southern New England Ho Regional Homebrew Competition, they gave it a 32. And I thought the, uh, the comment this guy had, the only thing he wrote was, there is a lot going on. I'd prefer a more pronounced honey flavor. That was his only comment. It's like, I mean. <laughs> so I get this all the time with heavy fruit meats. I get a lot of complaints that people can't taste the honey. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it, it does raise the blood pressure a little bit, but, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like, I mean, I kind of suspect some of that's coming from beer judges that are used to sort of old school meads that are didn't have this kind of fruit intensity and things right and, and yeah. um people are really pushing into just absurd levels of fruit now where it's like there's no water in the bucket it's you know um yeah and so if you're not you know if you if you pull somebody who's used to sort of the way mead was 10 years ago or something they're not necessarily going to be prepared for for something as intense right um, uh, yeah there's, there's also a school of people i think that just wants something like like these competitions are all judged under the auspices of BJCP, right? So, so there's a lot of like beer mindset. So, like we're presenting something to them that's like a dessert wine. That's like mm -hmm. very intense. It's it's meant to be consumed in two or three ounce portions, not in twelve or sixteen ounce portions, and that's jarring. I think you know. So, um, I think that you know we'll see if attitudes change. But yeah, I just thought it was box. it was funny. It was just funny that his comment there. And I, I called it, literally, I named the mead. I used a lot of berries mead. That's literally just what I called it. Because <laughs> it's, I mean, basically what happened. I should have said in honey, because that's also part of it, too. So, well, Matthew, thank you for being a part of this tasting. Um, like I started off, Matthew and I are doing a podcast. And not just because he's awesome, but in celebration of how awesome he is for winning the Ultimate Mead Maker 2023. And also, I get to pick his brain. Uh, I get the joy of learning about all of his meat experience and stealing from him all the information I can so I can maybe one day go and win lots of awards like he has won in his meat making career. So feel free to steal along with me if you'd like. Um, we, you know, we're all going to learn together, but you can find that in the link below the description for the podcast episode. But yeah, thank you for being part of this tasting, Matthew. Yeah, thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.